So good afternoon and welcome to this panel session looking at the problem of returns. It's not a new problem, it's something that's existed in retail as long as there's been retail, but with the growth in e-commerce, there seems to be this boom. I saw one report that described it as a return tsunami. So we cover it quite a lot at the publication I work for, Internet Retailing. My name is Katie Searles and it's my pleasure to chair for you today but it's the two gentlemen on my left that are really going to provide some insight and some colour into tackling this problem of returns. How do we go about it? Or is it something that we're just all going to have to live with? So introductions first. Andy, do you want to tell us a little bit about you and what you do? Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm um, Andy from IMRG. So uh, we're a trade body for online retail in the UK. Uh, so the thing that you might see us for is that we benchmark lots of data. So we have a weekly tracker where retailers give us their sales figures and then we plug that into our magical dashboard, which then says this is how you're doing in this area, this is how you're doing in that area. Um, and then they, you can get feedback as to which areas you need to improve. So we do sales, but we also do things like the percentage of visitors to your site that add something to their basket, that bounce on various pages, that click the buy button, etc., etc. Uh, so when we show you that, you can see you're above or below the market and whether you need to, uh, to do it quite well. Why am I on a returns panel? Good question. Uh, so we, we, we also get uh, a lot of, we do these studies where we um, will go to retailers and say, give us a load of information relevant to uh, how you perform from a returns perspective and we'll benchmark that information so that we can then feed back to you to say whether you've got the right time frame, whether things are coming back to you too fast, too slow um, and stuff like that. And I'll tell you a bit about that when we get into it. Excellent, thank you. And Don, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name is Don McGray. I'm the founder of Skins Golf. We're a golf brand that specializes in golf accessories and apparel. Uh, we're predominantly online, D2C, and we are predominantly UK based as well. Excellent, thank you. So to give a little bit of context, I'm going to hand over to you again, Andy, to just explain how did we get ourselves into this situation? How did we get to a point where returns is a headache for retailers, not only for their bottom line, but also any environmental credentials? Yeah, how did we get into this mess? Uh, fine question. Um, you have to cast your mind back a little bit uh, for those of us that have been working in the industry for a very long time. Um, I've been at IMRG for 13 years, so I've kind of uh, I've seen quite a lot. Um, when it when online first started, as it were, when online retail became a thing, there was this sort of sense that there were certain things you could buy online, predominantly tech stuff, but it wasn't really for stuff like clothes, right? Um, if you haven't tried something on, there's no way that someone would want to buy something. But of course, that's been um, that quickly got shown up as being daft. Um, but the thing that immediately accompanied that was, I haven't tried it on, and I do need to, to uh, perhaps send it back if it doesn't fit me. So. As time's gone by, it's become really apparent that there are certain categories where the return rate is low. So for example, in things like beauty, um, people don't really return fragrance and stuff like that very much, but they do return shoes and, um, and, and shirts and dresses and stuff like that. So depending on what category you're in, what, depending on what your price point is, um, you can have quite a, um, a wide ranging um, kind of problem with returns. The other thing that's come in and you know we'll sort of pick up on these in individually um, at first you had to pay for returns and then there was this idea primarily pushed by ASOS that we're going to let people return for free um, and then there were these kind of delivery um, packages that you could buy where you could you could return stuff for free as long as you're a member of this delivery subscription um, type package um, those things they kind of came in and they sort of went away um, because Actually, people take the piss a little bit when it comes to stuff like that, and they do just send stuff back because um, they feel like they've paid for it. Um, so it doesn't always necessarily work the way that you might um, hope that it would. But now we're very much in a phase where people are sort of charging for returns again because they, they don't really, um, that, that you need to have a decent bottom line. Um, so we've, end, we've kind of gone up here, we've gone down here, and now we're, you know, after you sort of pull a, a coil and it goes like that, we're sort of doing that at the minute. <laughs> and trying to settle um, into a reliable pattern. And just the other thing, Katie, the other thing that put a lot of pressure on retailers was the, the experience the customers had with Amazon. So 
pretty much the, the minute you return something through Amazon, the refund is almost back in your account, and that put a lot of pressure on retailers for ASOS and, and others to, to offer those free returns and improve the customer experience. But that's been reversing, and we'll talk about kind of the, the personalization that some brands can offer to kind of counter or to challenge Amazon to a degree. So we're 18 months in for Zara really setting the precedent when they began charging for returns or the reverse logistics fee. That was May 2022. Don, from a retailer's point of view, is charging for returns the answer or does that impact cost customer loyalty? Does it impact cart abandonment? Yeah, it, it does depend on the brand. I mean, you, you have to run your own um, experiments really with it and rely on the data. We've gone through both. We've charged returns and at the moment we're offering free returns. Um, the reason we offer free returns now is because, because having run the data, we've seen that returns rate aren't actually higher for ourselves once we've offered that free returns. Um, but conversion rates are slightly higher. So the, the benefits of that higher conversion rate have outweighed the cost, kind of the margin hit that you get from from uh, absorbing the costs of, of managing the returns. Um, so we've tested both, but we're running with free returns for now. Um, so yeah, that's how we're doing it. We're in quite an interesting situation with the cost of living crisis, inflation at record high. Is IMRG, are you seeing an impact on return levels? Is that upping? sort of that customer regret, that wanting that refund and sending things back quicker? Is there data to match that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a, f quite a few things, really. Um, the, the main thing is that people are returning more. I'm, and, it, and I'm speaking in certain categories here. So if you look at something like clothing, for example, where it does have a reasonable, um, reasonably high return rate, a lot of clothing retailers have seen that, that tick up. So people are returning more stuff, but they're also getting it back quicker. Right, so if you, uh, we did a study into this where we looked at the period it takes for people to return things. So if you take um, a four-week period, what percentage of your returns falls in week one, week two, week three, week four? It doesn't actually seem to matter very much what um, return time frame you offered. People will still send it back within the first two weeks. So about half of it comes back in the first two weeks. People still send it back in the third week. But then what do you do? You know, do you say, oh, I'm sorry, that's outside your return time frame. We're going to... We're going to fine you or whatever for that. It's not really good customer service. So you probably will just say thanks uh, for sending it back. But um, but sending it back, I think, portrays something about what you're, what you're talking about there, really, which is um, people are making decisions a lot quicker. So they're thinking, you know, I do want this thing. On the other hand, I probably I can't afford it. And there's always been an element of that in clothing. This, you know, I, I, you're right, I do want that. And to be fair, it's a merchandising success story for retail, right? You, you know, you, you're showing people things and they think it looks great. Um, but actually, when you get it home, you do think, I, I really can't afford this. Um, the I was drunk when I bought it um, thing still kind of applies in, in, in some respects. Uh, so, you know, there, there are a whole, a whole range of things kind of going on there. I think that the problem when, when economic times are hard, it, it does lead to sort of those bad behaviors um, going up a little bit more. So people will buy something and then, um, I mean, I, I find this amazing. I would, I would never do this. But apparently, people do buy things and then they, they kind of, you know, take a picture of themselves or whatever, stick it on Instagram, um, and then send it back. I mean, I just, I do, I find that amazing. Although I, I think if someone is doing that and you kind of know they're doing it, it might be worth looking at them and thinking, you know, have you actually got a reasonable number of friends and followers and stuff? You know, are you a de facto small-time influence or whatever? I mean, if you are, you know, instead of, making fun of us and buying things and then sending it back after you've taken a picture. Why don't we make this into a, a sort of relationship where we send you items from time to time and you can do it, but you know, just tag us and you know, help us out a little bit. I, th I think there's a blacklist and I think is a disaster. It's a disaster. Um, I've, been on, I've been on radio uh, four a few times about this. Whenever someone blacklists their customers, radio four instantly get on it and say, right, come on here and get told off because online retail has been really, really naughty. And they are actually, that is being a bit silly, I think. If you're, if you're saying, look, you've, you've returned too many things, you're not allowed to buy from us anymore. I think there's probably other ways that you can, um, you can deal with that issue rather than just getting yourself into the PR disaster. Because, you know, we've, in, in this day and age, if you do something like that, someone can that day just turn around and go, huh, I just got blacklisted by this company. Here's the email. You know, I've, 
I've, I've taken a picture of that, by the way, and put it on, the, um, on my social feed. So you get found out. And Don, from a brand point of view, is jumping on the back of what Andy said, communication key here. And actually, speaking to your customers in that way, handling returns in a much more sort of human, personal discussion sort of way, is, is that a way to handle it rather than just blacklisting them or charging them 199? Yeah, I mean, it, we think it's huge. It's a, it's a point of differentiation for us that we can offer that Amazon can't. So a human on the other end actually emailing the customer and understanding why are you returning something? Is there something else that we can recommend? What's, why are you exchanging something? Why is the size not right? So understanding why they're uh, returning or exchanging something is, is crucial for us. Because at the end of the day, it reduces the, the future exchange or return rate for that customer. So if they understand now why they, the size is not right for them, uh, it's unlikely that they would exchange something in the future. Uh, your retention rate is a lot higher as well. So once they've gone through a, a really good return or exchange experience, um, they're more than likely, and they're a few percentage points higher for us, likely to uh, come and order again from you. Uh, and then lastly, they're quite likely to leave a very positive review on your, either on your website, we're on Trust, Trust Pilot, which is quite important for us. Um, so they're the things, they're the kind of the three key things for us that are quite important that do make us stand out or a brand who wants to take on a level of personalization versus a, a, uh, an Amazon or versus a prepaid slip that's just in your, um, in your delivery, which gives the customer kind of an out just to say, do you know what, it's not really for me without understanding why. So uh, we want to speak to our customers as much as possible. and. This is one of the few ways where you can impress them um, because usually they're not too fond of the exchange experience. That prepaid slip is quite an interesting point. That you get something, there's already a label in it, there's a nice number of reasons why you could send it back. So it does, it makes it nice and convenient for consumers to send it back. Are we going to see that sort of changing into more of a digital returns portal that? as a QR code comes on, that that becomes more sophisticated, so you're not just getting this generic piece of paper sent back to you. And um, do you want to jump on, jump on that first, Don, and then we'll come to Andy? Yeah, I mean, potentially, we see the, the drop-off points in various shops as well that um, introduce a layer of friction, I suppose, to the returns process. I mean, I, I do find those prepaid slips obviously incredibly handy for a consumer and for us when we buy stuff, but. Uh, for a brand, they are too easy, and it makes the it makes the, the customer's decision for them in a lot of instances. So, you do want to introduce a a small bit of friction with the with the customer returns process. Not too much where they are put off by it, but where they, where they have a bad experience. But one where they actually think about it, and it's not just we'll buy something, we'll send it back as soon as possible. And is this problem, this returns issue, suddenly coming to the forefront of consumers' minds, is that actually a good thing? If we educate consumers about the problems, whether that's environmental or cost, could that in itself start to limit returns, Andy? Um, I think with, with the way that people um, conduct themselves, I'm going to say, uh, I mean, you know, take a look at me. I'm obviously quite a sustainability-minded sort of bloke, you can tell, can't you? Um, but I, I think people seem to give an idea of themselves that they act in a really sustainable way. If you ask them questions in a survey, you know, would you do this, would you do that? Absolutely, I would do it. Absolutely, you know. Do you shop? I absolutely shop ethically all the time. Yeah. And then when it actually comes to it, if you were to monitor their behavior, come on, mate, you, you know, you, you don't, do you? Um, so I think that relying on people to um, sort of do the right thing and, and say, hang on a minute, if we're sending things, but like to actually think about this, you know, we work in retail, right? So we, we think about this. Your average person doesn't think, hold on a minute, I bought that thing. If I send it back, is that another van trip? That might be bad for the environment. I'm, I'm going to not do that, you know. I just don't, I just don't think that they, they, they think about it like that. I think the portals thing is quite an interesting question. I think there's real sort of pros and cons. And, um, you know, the friction thing that you, you talk about there, it, it is a significant thing, but it's also to assume that people are quite technically savvy and, and actually some people would get really confused by log on to what, do what, printer, huh? Um, you know, that, that is kind of a problem for them. I was in M&S once and this, they've got these lockers and um, they send you a code. So you do a click and collect, you go in, 
you've got the code on the text, you type in the code into the, into the locker, right? It's really, it's really straightforward what you do. And this guy came over to me, not because I work in M&S, but he just came and said to me, like, I just can't work this out. What am I supposed to do it? I just said, did, 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 did. There you go. But he couldn't work it out. And, you know, you, if the, the more sort of technically difficult it is for people, they will struggle, I think, with it. Yeah, and, and just got to add to that, we, we do have um, quite a lot of the older generation who do go through that returns and exchange process with us. And we find that e email is a very good medium to actually explain that process to them because if they get very frustrated if you just send them a link to fill it out and they, uh, they don't know how to fill it out or they're filling it out wrong and you just leave it to them. And if there's no customer service then, they, they won't purchase from you again. So that's why we do find that that communication aspect allows them to go through it once, hopefully never again, but they know that someone's there to help if they do so. And is it just an email or do you have that good old fashioned phone number that even someone that's struggling with an email thread could call someone and talk them through it that way? Uh, we don't, I mean, it's something we've considered, but uh, I think email tends to be a medium that everyone does have a good grasp of um, and that you can manage quite well. So. Uh, but it is an option, obviously, down the line to have a phone number there to do it too. And as the technology advances, could this be a sort of cobalt communication tool on the website? Is that another thing that could make this process more efficient? Or is that, again, overcomplicating things? Um, I wouldn't say it's overcomplicating things. I mean, as we, as we go on, people will be more used to, I suppose, multiple brands offering different options, and they'll be quite well versed in the different technologies that brands offer in their return system. Uh, it is a bit of a, a web of uh, different options because no brand is the same. Everyone, everyone has a different customer uh, exchange experience. So um, for the moment, what's working well with us is just an online form. You, you send them a link, they go through that online form, it gives them a slip to print out, and they can um, put it on their parcel to send back. But um, I think customers are generally quite used to various different, uh, especially we're, we're pretty much purely online. So the customers that do buy from us tend to have an experience of different um, exchange uh, kind of processes. And Andy, is the returns process, as well as being a touch point for customer experience, it's also a way to gather data, to get information. Is there work to be done to tidy up that process to make sure that the returns information that's coming back is as clean as possible, or is that because it's down to the consumer, something that's still going to be a problem? Um, in an ideal world, yes. I mean, you, you know, what you're talking about, we would like to understand things a lot better, but the, the problem that you're going to have, and this is really a consistent thing, people have experimented with this, people just choose the first option, right? So if you say, why are you, why are you returning this? I don't care, all right, I just, want it, I just want it sent back, I don't want to hear all this. So if you change the order around, then the top one is what they select. So if you think to yourself, oh, 80% are saying it doesn't fit me. Well, it, it might be, but it, it's also just because they want it, they want to get shot of it. So how you gather that information um, is not really clear. I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible to um, engage with them very much on that, because they, the, the thing that they want is a refund, right? I've, I'll send the thing back, you know, ho hoping that this is actually a genuine, um, a genuine kind of experience we've had, and you're not trying to rip me off or whatever. Um, the thing that they want is, like, I bought the wrong thing, I don't want it. Um, can I have my money back, please? And it, I think the reassurance in the communication um, is, you know, it is about, um, you know, we've we've got the thing back. You can now have your money back. Because I think at the point where they say, you've confirmed, you've got it. Uh, I got my money back you know, happy days. But it is just the fact that if you've got to return something, it's, it's more annoying than not having to return something, right? So um, I, there, there isn't really a, you know, a, a phase that we get to where we think, oh, brilliant, you know, it returns is absolutely great now. I don't think it's going to get there. It is just the thing that's a bit, it's a bit annoying, but it's a reality of it. And uh, Don, touching on the refunds point, is it simply a returns means getting your money back, or is there an opportunity here for companies, even if they're D to C, to offer an exchange, to offer store credit? Do you get any feedback from your customers on what they would prefer, or is it simply, I want my money back and I'd like it in my account quite quickly, please? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you can suggest alternatives, and that's that's why the the customer touch points offers you the uh, the ability to do that. So if a customer says, well, this hoodie, um, the sleeves are too short, we know that the sleeves on our Q-zips are, are longer, so we'll, so we'll suggest that. We'll say, listen, I'll, you probably like our Q-zips because the, it'll fit you better. So, um, I mean, our golf gloves are our most exchanged item, and they're quite hard to buy online because you... you, you you measure your knuckles, you measure your hand, you don't really know what's going to fit or what, what doesn't. Uh, you can kind of guide them through that process as well. So um, it's not just a matter of kind of saying, you want to return something, we'll give you a refund straight away. It's trying to see, okay, they, they've obviously come to us and bought something for a reason. They obviously like the look of the store, the products. So uh, you're trying to feed off that a little bit and, and recommend something else. Um, you're not stopping them for returning, but you're, you're offering, them, offering them some alternatives, like a few options. Um, and then they're free to choose any of those, really. Sort of the size of it, the fit of it is always going to be a challenge, especially when you're doing D to C uh, with sportswear, with women's wear. Sorry, women's wear is awful. Um, could fit technology, could the development of AI of a size, sizing technology, is that going to be helpful or is it a sort of pie in the sky sort of idea? Um, I don't particularly think it's pie in the sky. I, I still think it wouldn't particularly change the exchange or returns rate. I mean, people will still have the same habits of buying something because they, they're they usually a medium. So if they see that the, the AI tells them that they're a large, they'll still be quite confused and, and they'll they'll go for the medium and then find out they actually were a large and then trust the AI on, on one website versus another. So um, it, not to say it's quite gimmicky, but I think people's habits are very, very hard to change with that. Um, their, their common sizes, uh, taking them off, that would be very difficult. So um, potentially if, if the technology is strong enough, but uh, I, I still don't think it's, it's there yet. You're nodding there, Andy. Is this technology not going to solve the returns problem? Uh, no. Um, if, it, if it would, then it, it, it would have done. So it, it's been around for, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, maybe longer than that. Um, and the solutions have had quite a long time to sort of develop and get smarter. But the returns rate has, has stayed up and in some cases even, even gone up a bit. So there's other factors that are at play there. You know, the, the technology's got better, but the, the, the customer behavior has overridden the advances in the technology. You know, if people are having a difficult time financially, they just seem to return more stuff. So, um, you know, with all the will in the world, I'd, I don't see it, but you know, let's come back in 10 years and then you can all laugh at me um, when these sort of AI machines that we're getting promised have you know, just completely eliminated returns. Let, let's see that. But I, I do think in, in clothing there is just something, you have to wear it. You know, there's, there's actually, it's been in the news quite a lot recently about, um, there was, well, there's a story today actually, I think it was H&M yes. who uh, came out and said, you know, we do need to work on our sizing um, a bit. So, but again, that's been, how long have, have we talked about that? It's, decades people have talked about that and it's not it's not really um, made any progress has it so um, I, I can't see a situation where all the sizing becomes completely standardized because people aren't standardized um, and you do you do need to try something on I know roughly what size I am but until you put it on you think oh I don't like the shoulder actually or I look a prat um, then you don't you don't really know do you so please join us in a decade's time for the return system is still broken um, oh, how am I going to finish this positively before I open it up to audience Q&A? Is there anything we can do? Is there anything that the retailers in our audience can do to maybe not fix it, but at least put a plaster on it? Yes, uh, on a positive note. Um, I think that looking at returns on its own is a mistake. Um, it's just one part of the overall thing, right? So everything is a spinning plate in a business. And if you kind of do really well on this bit and then this one falls over, you know, what you're trying to do is get the whole thing working properly. Um, so sizing guides and amazing technology and all that to one side. I mean, if, you're, if you do free returns or if you do paid returns, you know, it's up to you. If you do a 14 day return period or you do 365 days, you know, that's up to you. And it, it might change the behavior a little bit. If you do free returns at a certain for certain types of products or whatever, it's a complicated message, but you can do it, um, then you can change how people do things. And I think as long as you're smart about how you do that in a very building block kind of way, um, as long as you're seeing overall that 
you know, the, the revenue is, is good, the, the profit margin is, is good, then as a business, you're winning, aren't you? Um, I think to give somebody, a, you know, a classic mistake would be to give someone a project internally and say, right, you, go and get our return rate down from 20% to 18% or something, you know? Oh, great, yeah, because they, they might go and do that, but then it has a knock-on effect on some other stuff and it's just no good. So I think, you know, if you're a smart business who are, are doing lots of things that are keeping the customer satisfied, I think everything will roughly take care of itself, but don't expect returns to go away. And Don, is there anything you're doing to, to make that process either better for your consumers or better for your team? Is there any, things that, any little changes you want to make to tweak to improve it? Yeah, there's always things here and there. I think the, the key point is to test as much as you can and use the data to inform your decisions. So testing free returns versus 199 returns or uh, introducing the customer email experience instead of just, say, a link that you provide on your uh, returns page. So um, testing vociferously and then just using the data as much as possible to inform, inform your decisions, really. Excellent. My favorite bit of the session will open the floor for questions. Um, can we get this lady on the end with a mic, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for, and thank you all for the presentation. Um, you were saying, Andy, that uh, returns are not sustainable. Um, what do you think about last mile delivery solutions? Uh, do you think this could be solving a problem regarding uh, deliveries and returns? Um, do you think this is an opportunity and can you see emerging solutions on that? So <coughs> emerging solutions, um, how do you mean, sorry, with? with uh, last mile delivery solutions. Um, are retailers looking for that? Uh, is this something that can solve uh, this sustainable issue with uh, deliveries and returns? Yeah, so, um, it all exists, right? The infrastructure absolutely exists. So you, you see these kind of cargo bikes going around. Um, you know, there's, I don't mean like Deliveroo and stuff. I mean, it, it, these little trikes and they have these cargo things on the back of them. Um, the way that their models tend to work is if you bring in lots of parcels to their little warehouse, they'll have these little depots around, or however that you get the parcels to them. If you fill the bike, so it's got lots and lots of parcels, then it can be cost effective for the retailer. But that means that you need to have lots of drops to make in actually quite a small area. It'll probably be about three miles square or something like that. So you have to have real density um, within that area for it to work. If you don't have that density, then the, because you're adding in a, a step on the delivery, it, you're, you're adding in cost. Um, so it's the age old problem, really. You know, yes, we can deliver it by bicycle. We're still making a van journey, by the way. Um, but you know, if, if you've got real significant volume moving through that kind of network, through the cycle, cycles, through click and collect, I think click and collect is, is the big opportunity. If people went and picked up their own thing and didn't drive, you know, it's an, it's an extremely good network. You know, you do live near a click and collect unit. You know, most people do. We could go and do it, but I don't, I don't think we do. I don't think we particularly use lockers. So I think for it to get better, I think there's, there's a change that needs to happen with, with people. It's, it's not, you know, the businesses have tried to do their bit. If the demand is not there, it, it just doesn't work. Can we have a mic for the gentleman in the blue shirt in the front, please? Thank you. Yeah, hi guys. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Batchelor, DSV Solutions. Uh, I like this question before, but I, my question is a little bit, if I try to open it up a little bit, as a retailer, and if you could maybe possibly speak for other people sitting here in the group, what can we do as a 3PL provider to help this? Because this is one of our huge customer problems we see every day, and, and how, do we, how do we get close to the expertise that you guys have? Because traditionally, you've seen the return process between the retailer and the, and the end consumer. How can we, as 3PL providers, if you could give us any insight in that, and maybe we can help the problem as well. What, what do you currently offer? <laughs> we actually just ask our customers what, what they want, and, and we, we, provide, we provide what what's traditional 
traditionally. One of the things that we see a lot of is we see uh, a lot of our retailers wanting to know earlier that the, the product is coming return. This is, a, this is a huge issue in a lot of three pillar areas. It's not until it gets into our warehouse that you actually know it's coming return. Uh, th those types of issues. But again, just if you could give us any insight on what we could do to possibly help this, that would, that would help us a lot. So, I mean, one of, the, one of the key things that they want is to get it back into stock very quickly, right? So if something's out, we need to get it back. A counterbalance to that, though, is that we're seeing a very weak demand in this in the UK, right? So the online market is, is struggling. It's, we, we've just had 29 months on a, on a bounce of negative growth. Um, August, we got 1% up. So it's a tough market. So, you know, what I was saying there about getting it back into stock very quickly, it doesn't mean that it's going to sell uh, really quickly. So I, I think there's, there's, there's all, it's all the things that have got to work in tandem, really, is, 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 the, is the, the challenge. And I, I think people can, like I said, I think people can experiment a bit with, um, with what they offer. If you offer, for example, so we looked at this, if you offer 14 days return time frame and then you extend it to, let's say, 60 days, it, it doesn't change the, um, the way that the returns come back that much, right? So it doesn't mean on day 59, you get a big tsunami of returns, right? Where people go, hang on a minute, there's that thing that I bought, I need to get it back. Well, they don't think like that. People buy things because they think they want them. And then they decide, actually, I don't want this. So as much as logistically, you know, all you can do is move something backwards and forwards. Um, I think that, you know, a better understanding of when, how, why, all that stuff, which we've talked about how difficult uh, that stuff is. Um, ultimately, that's, that's the thing that's going to help you to, to operate better. You know, what do they want? They want to be able to reduce the cost that you'll charge them, which means better, um, better efficiency and better consolidation and things. Um, you know, if you could have a solution where you can really, really consolidate, and, you know, I don't know what partnerships you need to make to do that, but that's the stuff, because then there is a sustainability message in that, which they could take to their partners and say, to their customers and say, look, we are actually trying to do something here. The other thing, of course, is electric vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Don, do you have that issue with visibility and working with a 3PL and getting your product back? You've got, do you have a whole view of the delivery process, but actually the reverse logistics process, you sort of lose that visibility? Yeah, it, no, it's a really good point. It's um, look, you, you you get the return. The customer says they send it. You can see on your uh, return system that it's in transit. Uh, it takes it takes a while to get there because Royal Mail they can be quite slow delivering things. Guess through your warehouse. Uh, we use the three PL as well, so it takes time to go through the return system because they have multiple brands to work with as well. So um, during that time, you can kind of lose the customer in terms of their experience. They can get quite frustrated with, well, I've sent it on Tuesday and you still haven't processed it by the following Wednesday. So um, one of the ways we look to counter that is by trying to get the consumer to, uh, to purchase that other item there and then during that conversation. So if they're looking to exchange from a large to an extra large, um, we kind of explained to them that it may take a while to send this new item out because it has to go through our return system, it has to be sent to us, has to be um, inspected, etc. And if they can order that with the knowledge that there's a good returns process there with the with the brand, um, you've kind of satisfied their need to get that kind of product back to them as soon as possible, and that their return, their their refund will be back into their account as soon as it's arrived back in our warehouse. So um, that's the way that the way we manage it is trying to kind of get that get that new product back into their hands as soon as possible. Um, there's a lady in the headband. Can we get a mic? Thank you. Hey, uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> I speak quite loud. Uh, Don, this question's for you. And it's going to be a little bit self-serving because I work for Loop, which is a returns and exchanges app. Um, at what point do you feel like you would need to introduce an actual application versus having that one-to-one -one experience where customers are reaching out to your customer service team. Like, at what point is that one-to-one -one communication just not scalable anymore? Yeah, no, that's it's the last point you made there. It's it's really down to volume. So if we 
saw that the volume of customer requests coming in were really kind of overtaking our capacity to service that and the cost of having customer service agents to um, to deal with the amount of requests coming in, then we may need to automate it more and kind of lose that customer touch point. Um, fortunately enough, our returns rate aren't that high and we do use that, that customer touch point to kind of reduce them as much as possible during the process. So um, volume and scale would be what would move us off kind of the one-to-one uh, -one interactions. Do we have any more questions? The lady in the purple blazer. Hi, um, I'm from a carrier, international carrier, so just adding a sort of an international flavor to it. What we've noticed over the last couple of years is that there's definitely more options being used, whereas before it would be like, get it back as quick as you can, and it would probably be sent by air freight in small batches, not very sustainable. Now there seems to be, depending on the goods, yeah, and the value of the goods, more of a tendency to perhaps look at reselling, e-fulfillment, um, or bigger batches not take and not being returned quite so often as before. So it's maybe not a question, but it's just what, what we've noticed happening. Are you seeing, Andy, a sort of change with the, the re-commerce, the pre-loved, the C2C offerings? Is, is that actually going to have an impact on returns as consumers take the lead and decide, I'm going to make a little bit of money off this and stick it on Vinted, Depop, other apps are available? So, uh, I think something's happening. Um, I've been saying that for 10 years, and um, I'm always wrong, because I want something good to happen with my, my hair and all. Um, I've got the sense that it's been very slow, uh, but if you speak to someone like Collect Plus, for example, they'll tell you that actually that second-hand thing is becoming, starting to become a significant portion of the parcels that they're seeing through their network. So, maybe. Things are maybe things are actually happening, but you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see the figures myself before I can really say. And Don, is that something that's even an option for your consumers? Do people want to use a second hand pair of gloves, or because it's such a personal thing, it, it has to be sent back either way? Yeah, it does. I mean, um, it's also quite a low value item as well, so it's um, let's say a, a 20 pound golf glove. So um, it's, it's not something that the, the customer would think about reselling for any great value, and I, I don't think the golfing industry or that consumer would be susceptible to buying second-hand gloves, but uh, yeah, I, I can see how it could happen for certainly higher value items in, in, the, in the fashion industry. Any more questions from the audience? Oh, did, yes, just gentleman here with the blue blazer. Oh, just pass over. <laughs> Hey Don, just one for you, mate. Um, what percentage of the items that are returned can you restock? What percentage of our returns can we restock? Um, it's a very high percentage, so because the we do give very clear kind of instructions to the consumer that they can't return it on if it's been worn, especially with with golf gloves. That's that's kind of crucial. Um, and I think there's an understanding amongst the customer base that that would be the case in our industry. Um, but it, it's a very, very high proportion that's, that's restocked, yeah. And do you have processes in place that, for quality checking? Is there any, sorry, I'm not a golfer, do you have to yeah. wash golf gloves? I don't know, like is... Uh, you can, can you? very carefully, but uh, <laughs> the, there is a quality control team with our 3PL that goes through the, um, we do sell clothing as well, so they go through the clothing to check for any marks or wear or od odors or anything like that, so. Uh, thankfully, we, we have that in place, and there's kind of kind of stringent checks on it before it comes back into suck. Any more questions from audience? Yes, just gentlemen down the front here. Thank you. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, proactive communication uh, against your customers? For example, if you have some checks about the orders, you can see they're ordering. Uh, some stuff that are quite similar so you actually can tell already that there are some returns going on here because yes. they're buying two different sizes or something so do you make 
proactive communication to the customer asking if they have ordered two different sizes because they are not 100% sure what to, to use and so on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah we're, we're pretty active on that. Um, we see a lot of people who order, let's say, a, a three pack of gloves and one of them is a, it's, it's, it's a man buying three gloves, one of them is a, a women's right-handed glove and it looks off versus what they're ordering. So you, you kind of speak to them, just checking, is this what you're supposed to order? And they say, oh no, very sorry, like didn't mean to do that, could you, could you change the order? Um, we do see people ordering, say, multiple of one item, so four hats, and you're kind of thinking, okay, is that, are they buying the four hats to try them all on and see what they like? You, you can't do it with every customer, but where there's an obvious, um, where it looks like there's an obvious kind of error. Um, I mean, in golf, there's 90, over 95% of golfers are right-handed, so when you see a certain product being ordered uh, alongside the, the standard item, then you kind of, you, you kind of raise your eyebrows and then give them a courtesy email. Um, and that has stopped quite a few kind of returns coming our way. So it's, uh, if you can have your customer service team in place to kind of proactively do that, then you're, uh, yeah, you're making great strides. So. Andy, that sort of idea of bracketing, wardrobing, you touched on it earlier, people literally just taking a picture of something and then sending it back. Is there anything that retailers who sort of don't have the personal communication set up that um, Don does, is there anything they can do to limit wardrobing and bracketing or is it just part of retail now? Um, it's different with, depends what type of retailer you are really. I mean, if you're selling perfume or something, you, it's not really a thing, is it? But if you're selling quite an expensive garment, for example, then you might be a little bit more open to it, in which case it might be something that you focus on. Um, I know some, the more luxury you are, basically, the more likely that sort of thing is to, um, is to happen. It's not just, not just clothes either, it's like um, home items, you know, they put them in their home and take pictures and then send them back. But, you know, I think you need to look at it. it to what extent is this a really bad problem for us? Um, is this person, buying stuff and keeping it as well, you know. You, know. Um, you can, you can over-focus on something that might be a slightly small problem. Um, so it depends how significant it is for you. Um, one thing I would chuck in though, which is just to bring, it all, bring us all, all down, just to finish, um, is I sort of get the impression that there's just like, there's a bit of crime going on in, in e-com. So um, I, I, I had to go on Radio 4 a couple of months ago, and it was, it was because of an Amazon story the way that they decide what story they're going to cover um, on their consumer program is based on the volume of emails they get about a certain subject. And they said it was the highest number of emails they've ever had for any story they've ever done. And it was people buying something, like an iPhone, and then a tin of dog food turns up. And then when they say, well, I've just, you've sent me a tin of dog food, they say, well, no, we haven't, because it was checked out of the warehouse and, it, and everything was done at the right place and everything. So, Somewhere along the line, there's something dodgy going on, and it's quite a big thing. And apparently Amazon, big technology Amazon, couldn't work it out. Um, so there's something going on there, and also people are sending things back sometimes, and then the retailer's saying to him, but you sent us back a brick. Or, or something. And then they say, no, I didn't. I sent back the thing that I intended to send. Um, and then you get into an argument with them when they swear blind that they, they sent you back the thing that they, they did. So somewhere along the line, there is a little bit of dodginess going on, uh, which hopefully gets stamped out. But it does mean that from the, re from the customer perspective, you almost feel like when you open something, you need to film it. You know, and then if, if you're returning something, you almost want to record yourself putting it back in. So I think there's, there's kind of a bit of negativity that could flow in if, if this stuff doesn't get sorted out. The unboxing experience is probably a different conversation, but the fraudulent returns point is really interesting that Again, it touches on the C to C market as well. How do you know something is a genuine return? If you buy one brand and you get a fake back, are retailers really struggling with that? Is that something that, again, technology could help with? Or is, is it just, how do they squash that? Again, it's a, it's a brand by brand thing, isn't it? And the more sort of luxury you are, the more it might be a little bit of an issue for you. People might try and rip you off a little bit to keep that very expensive item and send you back a bit of a lesser garment, um, should we say. But, you know, it's a specific problem for a specific type of company, I think. Do we have any more audience questions? No. Well, that's it. Um, 
I'm being told to cut it. Sorry. You can ask them just now by yourself. But can everybody please put their hands together for our panelists and in Dawn.